Hello and welcome to Void Electronics. In today's video I will show you how to design a simple common emitter amplifier using a bipolar transistor. And I know, today it's all about MOSFETs and op-amps, however, bipolar transistors still have their place in some circuits like bandgap references, emitter coupled logic and RF front ends, so I think it's important to understand how they work and how to design circuits with them. And a good starting point would be a common emitter amplifier, so let's get started. By the way, make sure to watch the entire video because as always I want to build the circuit that we are designing today to make sure that it actually works. Let's start with the schematic. For the schematic I will assume that you know it already or that uh, you know the purpose of every single circuit element in here and if you don't stay tuned because I will explain them in a different video. But I want to keep this video relatively short so we won't do this today. This is what the schematic looks like. We need four resistors here. We need a bipolar transistor, of course. These go up to VCC. These go to ground. And we need some coupling capacitor. This is the input, which is coupled through a capacitor. And we couple the output out of the collector. Why is it called common emitter? Because the emitter is common to both the input and the output. That's because we apply our input to the base and we couple the output out of the collector so the emitter is sort of common for both. Now let's give some names to these resistors. Let's call this R1, R2, R3 and R4. And now in order to move on we need to have some specs. Let's say we want to design an amplifier with a voltage gain of 10 and uh, a VCC of 9 volts so that we can easily power it from a 9 volt battery. And starting with this we can start the design process. And the first step in this design process is to choose the collector current. This is not an exact science here um, so you can simply use a reasonable value or something like that and um, continue from there. So for uh, low power preamps or, or something like that a current of uh, a few milliamps is reasonable. Let's go with one milliamp. As soon as this is uh, not excessive for your transistor and you stay close to this value, this circuit uh, should work. Moving on, the step number two is to choose the collector voltage. And uh, we need the output to be able to swing both up and down. So it makes sense to have the collector right in the middle between VCC and ground. So VC equals VCC divided by 2, which is 4.5 volts. We need this later and you will see why. Step number 3 is calculating the simplest resistor right here. And you will see that some resistors are easier to calculate than others and we will start with the simplest one of course, which is R3 in this case. So to calculate R3 we need Ohm's law of course. And we need a voltage drop across the resistor first, which is VCC minus VC. So it's VCC minus VC. And the current through the resistor is the collector current, which we decided already. So we have it right here. And this is uh, 9 minus 4.5 volts divided by 1 milliamp, which gives us a value of 4.5 kilo ohms. Another challenge in the design process of such an amplifier is that we need to choose resistors that we can actually buy. And to do this uh, we need to choose them from the E12 series or something like that. And the closest E12 value is uh, 4.7k. So we will go with this instead. And we already have the first value here which is 4.7k. Let's move on to the next resistor. So step number four is calculating uh, R4 based on a very important formula of this circuit which is the formula for the voltage gain. I will assume that you know it by heart and I will explain it in a different video. So the voltage gain of this topology is approximately RC divided by RE which is the collector resistor divided by the emitter resistor and in our case that is uh, R3 divided by R4 and it's also 10. So we already know the voltage gain and R3, so this gives us the value for R4, which is 10 times smaller than R3, so 
R4 is 470 ohms. With this in mind, we can move on to the next resistors here. So this is 470 ohms. So these are a bit more tricky, but still manageable, don't worry. In order to calculate this, the first thing that you need to know is the base voltage, which is the voltage right here. To calculate it, we need to find the path from this voltage to ground. And as you can see from this voltage, we have the base emitter junction voltage drop right here, VBE. And then we have another voltage drop, which is the voltage drop across R4, which we can call VE, because this is the emitter voltage. So, step number five, calculating VB, is uh, just summing up VBE plus VE. And we know VBE, because this is the typical uh, voltage drop across uh, PN junction at room temperature, so it's around 650 millivolts. And VE is something that we need to calculate based on a few assumptions. And here we need to introduce another important formula for this topology and for bipolar transistor in general, which is uh, beta. So beta is basically the ratio between the collector current and the base current. We will need this and we will assume that beta is much larger than one. And this is really useful for our uh, design process here because if this is true, then we can say that the collector current is approximately equal to the emitter current. Now, this is of course not true, but it's good enough for our design process. And uh, this will allow us to calculate VE. So VE, in this case, is approximately equal to the collector current times R4. And uh, this is 1 milliamp times 470 ohms, which gives us a value of uh, around 470 millivolts. So now we can go back to calculating VB, which is VB uh, or 650 millivolts plus VE, which is 470 millivolts, which gives us a value of 1.12 volts. So now we know the voltage at this node here which is really important. The next step is to choose the base divider current. So let's say, let's say this is step number six. And um, as you can see here, we have a voltage divider. It's not an ideal voltage divider because we are drawing current out of it. But uh, by making some assumptions, we will assume that this current doesn't matter all that much. To do this, we need the minimum beta of our transistor, which is something that we can take out of the data sheet. So the, this is the worst case for this circuit and the minimum beta for our transistor is 50. This is the worst case. This will be used to calculate the maximum base current. So IB, let's call it max, is the collector current divided by beta min and it's 1 milliamp divided by 50 which gives us uh, a value of 20 microamps. Now in order to have a stable circuit we need a divider current that is around 10 times greater than this current. So I will choose IDIV to be 10 times IB so this gives us a value of 200 microamps. So let's call this current right here IDIV. Now that we know this current, we can calculate the two remaining resistors in this circuit. So step number seven is calculating R1. In order to calculate R1, we will make another assumption here, which is that beta is much larger than one, which means that the IB is approximately equal to zero. This is not true, but uh, we made the divider current much larger, so this works for us. So R1 is then equal to the voltage drop across it, which is VCC minus VB, divided by the divider current, which is IDIV. So this is 9 minus 1.12 divided by 
200 micrograms, which gives us a value of 39.4 kilo ohms. Once again, this is not in the E12 series, so the closest value is uh, 39 kilo ohms. And finally, the last step, which is step number 8, is calculating R2. So, the voltage drop across R2 is VB. And the current through R2 is the divider current, which we call IDIV, which gives us uh, a value of uh, 1.12 divided by 200 microamps, which is 5.6 kilo ohms, which conveniently enough is already in the E12 series. And that's it with the design process. Now, in order for this circuit to work, we need some um, coupling capacitors for the input and the output. And of course, it's good practice to calculate them. But since we don't want to make this video too long, we will just use some reasonable values of 4.7 microfarads for both of them. Of course, based on the minimum frequency that you want uh, this amplifier to amplify, you can calculate these uh, capacitors, but we need to take the input impedance into account and uh, the input impedance of the next stage into account in order to calculate them. So let's keep things simple and just use these values for now. By the way, don't forget that this is an inverting amplifier. So if you apply a sine wave here that goes like so, as you increase the base voltage, you increase the collector current and if you increase the collector current, then the transistor pulls this node down. And if it does that, then the output is basically inverted with respect to the input. So the output will look like so. Which means that the voltage gain is actually minus 10 in this case. Now let's build the circuit and see if it works. The first step is choosing a transistor like this general purpose 2N2222 and then you need to find the pin out of this uh, transistor, meaning which pin is which, which can be found using a universal tester like this one or this is something that you can also find in the data sheet. It's important to check it instead of assuming one pin out because even though the transistor is in uh, this uh, TO92 capsule it doesn't mean that all of them have the same pin out which is unfortunate and uh, in this case the pin out is EBC and uh, the tester also gives us an indication of the HFE which is more or less the beta and in this case it's 217 we assume that it is uh, 50 or more, so this means that uh, it's looking good already. To build this, I will use a breadboard, a 9 volt battery, a socket for 9 volt battery, two capacitors and a few resistors, the transistor of course, and then we need to build a minimal test bench around it, which consists of a signal generator to apply a test signal and an oscilloscope to watch the input and the output and confirm that the circuit works. So I will put a transistor somewhere around here. Then we need the emitter, a resistor of 470 ohms within the emitter, which is the first pin and the ground. Something like that. Then we need to connect the collector resistor, which goes between the last pin and the VCC. This is 4.7k and then um, I couldn't find the right uh, base resistor so instead of 39k I will use a 33k let's hope it doesn't matter all that much this one goes between VCC and the base and to compensate for the slightly lower uh, resistor value I will use a slightly lower value for the um, resistor between base and ground so instead of 5.6k I will go with a 5.1k and uh, we will see what happens. A good sanity check for this circuit is to have a look at the collector voltage and if the collector voltage is right, chances are that this circuit works. Remember that the collector needs to be between the VCC and ground right in the middle, so at 4.5 volts. Now to couple the input into the circuit, we will need a 4.7 microfarad capacitor between the input and the base. The positive goes to the base, of course, because it's positive biased and uh, the output capacitor is coupled from the collector to the output that goes to the oscilloscope 
and once again the positive goes to the collector because the collector sits at a positive voltage. This multimeter looks at the collector voltage so let's turn it on and see what we get. Okay, this is not ideal, we have 3.6 volts instead of 4.5, so this circuit will work, but um, it's not biased properly, and I don't like that, so you can fix it by tweaking the base divider. It may be counterintuitive, but I don't want to touch the collector resistor and the emitter resistor, because they will also change the gain and so on. So what we can do here is we can actually decrease the collector current, and this will bring it... Uh, closer to what we calculated and to do this we need to change the resistor and uh, the base resistor to ground is the best choice here so I will take it out and I will replace it with a lower value so instead of 5.1 I will go with uh, 4.7k and let's see if this uh, fixes our circuit oh it's much better as you can see so now this is close enough it's 4.3 instead of 4.5 so it's perfect and finally we have an input here provided by this signal generator and an output that goes to the scope and we can have a look at both the input and the output on the oscilloscope and as you can see the circuit works so we are feeding a 1 kilohertz sine wave at uh, around 700 millivolts peak to peak and the sensitivity of the output is 10 times lower than the input and uh, if the signals look uh, perfectly equal on the oscilloscope, that means that the gain is exactly 10. As you can see, the gain is close enough. And now we can play with it to see when it distorts. Let's increase the input, for example. And as you can see, at 800 millivolts at the input, it starts distorting, which is fine. And we can also play with the input frequency to see the bandwidth of this circuit. Let's see if it still works at around uh, 1 MHz. Okay, it's not very happy, but we can disconnect the multimeter and this will probably help. And it did. And it looks like it still works at 1 MHz. But, um, I'm not sure if we get uh, much more bandwidth than this. How about 2 MHz? Okay, it still does something, so maybe we have around... Uh, I don't know, 1 MHz of bandwidth or something like that, which is good enough. Now, if we design this circuit right, the beta of the transistor or the transistor shouldn't matter all that much. So let's see if it works with a totally different transistor. So instead of this 2N2222, we will use a transistor that is not supposed to work here, which is the BFI90, which is a VHF transistor or something like that. It's totally different, probably totally different beta and so on. Let's uh, challenge the circuit just a bit and see if it works. And it still works. As you can see the collector voltage is right, the waveform is right. So yeah, the circuit is pretty tolerant to changes. Of course the output voltage is not identical, but the circuit works. And it can be tweaked for this transistor, of course. And the final party trick of this circuit is that it also works with an ancient PNP germanium transistor. This is an OC622. And to pull this off, of course, I had to reverse the battery lead. So now we feed it a negative voltage. And then I had to reverse the coupling capacitors. Let's see if this works. And as you can see, it is bang on with the PNP germanium, even though it is a really low beta on the universal tester and it's probably very leaky as well. Actually, just uh, touching it can change the bias point a little bit. So that's it. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. And if you're interested in more content related to electronics and programming, please subscribe to this channel because there is more content like this on the way. Also, don't forget that Void Electronics is more than just a YouTube channel. It's actually an online electronics community. So if you want to talk to more people who are also interested in electronics, you can join the Discord server. And you can also support this community by giving me a super thanks or by joining the channel using a monthly subscription. That's all for now. Bye.